The use of biomarkers in clinical studies has become increasingly important in the development of new drugs as they offer important insights into normal and pathogenic processes and the pharmacological response to therapeutic intervention, which can ultimately impact patient outcomes. So what goes into validation of assays for biomarkers that can help your organization make decisions in the drug development process? As a 26-year veteran in preclinical drug discovery and the bioanalytical field, I've had the opportunity to lead the development and validation of immunoassays for biomarkers and cell-based assays in support of numerous preclinical and clinical studies. In that time, I've seen the complexities of biomarker validation firsthand, but I've also seen the ultimate time and cost benefits it can drive. Validation of a biomarker assay is a process to assess whether the assay meets a set of performance characteristics that demonstrate that the assay is reliable for the intended application. This is generally referred to as fit for purpose. Validation of a biomarker assay is very similar to validation of immunoassays for pharmacokinetics or PK, but the presence of the endogenous biomarker in the sample can pose challenges that are typically not an issue for PK immunoassays. The performance characteristics are evaluated against predetermined target acceptance criteria. So what exactly are the performance characteristics we evaluate? First, we look at the calibration range and standard curve precision and accuracy. A standard curve is run in every validation run. The calibration range is the range of calibrated concentrations that have been shown to have reproducible precision and accuracy. Next, we assess inter and intra-assay precision and accuracy. Here we are assessing the within-day or intra-assay and day-to-day -day or inter-assay performance. In this assessment, matrix samples containing low levels of the biomarker are spiked at several levels through the range of the standard curve to determine how well the spike material can be recovered. Precision is the key to demonstrating reproducibility. This assessment is also used to determine the upper and lower limits of quantification for the assay. But how do we assess the ability to quantify the biomarker in the presence of other components in the matrix? Well, that's done with selectivity, where 10 to 20 individual matrix samples containing low levels of the endogenous biomarker are spiked at a concentration that is close to the lower limit of quantification on the standard curve. Precision and percent recovery are assessed. Hand in hand with selectivity is specificity, which is the ability of the assay to distinguish and quantify the biomarker in the presence of structurally similar endogenous or exogenous molecules or components. Ideally, neat matrix with low endogenous levels of the biomarker is spiked with the biomarker singly or in combination with other related analytes. Dilution linearity is used to determine if the biomarker, when present at concentrations greater than the highest calibrator, can be measured accurately after diluting to bring the biomarker into the quantifiable range of the assay. Dilution linearity is done using matrix samples that have been spiked with known high concentrations of the biomarker and then diluted stepwise at least four times with calibration buffer. If samples with high endogenous levels of the biomarker are available, parallelism can be assessed. This test is used to determine if the immunoreactivity or response of the biomarker in sample matrix is similar to that of the calibrator diluent. Usually this is a recombinant version of the biomarker. It should be noted that in addition to dilution linearity and parallelism, the prozone or hook effect may be observed in samples that have very high concentrations of the biomarker. The presence of a hook effect can produce a falsely measurable result in a sample that has a concentration greater than the quantifiable range of the assay. The hook effect can be assessed by spiking matrix with very high concentrations of the biomarker, up to 100 times greater than the top calibrator on the standard curve if possible, and diluting stepwise to the top of the standard curve. Lastly, it is very important to understand various aspects of the stability of, of samples to know how to treat study samples. In short-term stability, samples containing low and high concentrations of the biomarker are assessed for their stability for four to six hours at room temperature and 16 to 24 hours at refrigerated temperature. In addition, the high and low stability samples are subjected to a number of cycles of freezing and thawing. The percent recovery of the biomarker is determined after each treatment along with precision of the measurement. For long-term stability, the high and low concentration samples are stored for longer time intervals at temperatures that mimic the storage conditions of study samples, typically minus 20 degrees centigrade or minus 80 degrees centigrade. The time intervals usually encompass the length of the clinical study in which the samples will be collected and analyzed. 
The typical time intervals are 1, 3, 6, and 12 months.